Secret of Success in Christian Life by T.L. Moody. This is Chapter 3, Witnessing and Power. The subject of witnessing bearing in the power of the Holy Spirit is not sufficiently understood by the Church. Until we have more intelligence on this point, we are laboring under great disadvantage. Now, if you will take your Bible and turn to the 15th chapter of John, and the 26th verse, you will find these words. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Here we find what the Spirit is going to do, or what Christ said he would do when he came, namely, that he should testify of him. And if you will turn over to the second chapter of Acts, you will find that when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and testified of what Christ had done, the Holy Spirit came down and bore witness to that fact, and men were convicted by hundreds and by thousands. So then, man cannot preach effectively of himself. He must have the Spirit of God to give ability and study God's word in order to testify according to the mind of the Spirit. What is the testimony? If we keep back the gospel of Christ and do not bring Christ before the people, then the Spirit has not the opportunity to work. But the moment Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and bare witness to this one fact, that Christ died for sin and that he had been raised again and ascended into heaven, the Spirit came down to bear witness to the person and work of Christ. He came down to bear witness to the fact that Christ was in heaven, and if it was not for the Holy Ghost bearing witness to the preaching of the facts of the gospel, do you think that the church would have lived during these last centuries? Do you believe that Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension would not have been forgotten as soon as his birth, if it had not been for the fact that the Holy Spirit had come? Because it is very clear that when John made his appearance on the borders of the wilderness, they had forgotten all about the birth of Jesus Christ. Just thirty short years, it was all gone. They had forgotten the story of the shepherds. They had forgotten the wonderful scenes that took place in the temple when the Son of God was brought into the temple and the older prophet and prophetess were there. They had forgotten about the wise men coming to Jerusalem to inquire where he was that was born King of the Jews. That story of his birth seemed to have just faded away. They had forgotten all about it. And when John made his appearance on the border of the wilderness, it was brought back to their minds. And if it had not been for the Holy Ghost coming down to bear witness to Christ, to testify of his death and resurrection, these facts would have been forgotten as soon as his birth. Greater Work The witness of the Spirit is the witness of power. Jesus said, these works that I do shall ye also do, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to the Father. I used to stumble over that. I didn't understand it. I thought, what greater work could any man do than Christ had done? How could any one raise a dead man who had been laid away in a scepter for days, and who had already begun to turn back to dust? How, with a word, could he call him forth? But the longer I live, the more I am convinced it is a greater thing to influence a man's will, a man whose will is set against God, to have that will broken and brought into subjection to God's will. Or in other words, it is a greater thing to have power over a living, sinning, God-hating man than to quicken the dead. He who could create a world could speak a dead soul into the life. But I think the greatest miracle this world has ever seen was the miracle at Pentecost. Here were men who surrounded the apostles, full of prejudice, full of malice, full of bitterness, their hands, as it were, dripping with the blood of the Son of God, and yet an unlettered man, a man whom they detested, a man whom they hated, stands up there and preaches the gospel, and three thousand of them are immediately convicted and converted and becomes disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and are willing to lay down their lives for the Son of God. It may have been on that occasion that Stephen was converted, the first martyr, and some of the men who soon after gave up their lives for Christ. This seems to me the greatest miracle this world has ever seen. But Peter did not labor alone. The Spirit of God was with him, hence the marvelous results. The Jewish law required that there should be 
two witnesses. And so we find that when Peter preached there was a second witness. Peter testified of Christ, and Christ says that the Holy Spirit comes, he will testify of me. And they both bore witness to the varieties of our Lord's incarnation, ministry, death, and resurrection. And the result was that a multitude turned as with one heart unto the Lord. Our failure now is that preachers ignore the cross and veil Christ with sapless sermons in superfine language. They don't just present him to the people plainly. And that is why I believe that the Spirit of God don't work with power in our churches. What we need is to preach Christ and present him to the perishing world. The world can get on very well without you and me, but the world cannot get on without Christ, and therefore we must testify of him and the world, I believe, today is just hungry and thirsting for divine, satisfying portions. Thousands and thousands are sitting in darkness, knowing not of this great light, but when we begin to preach Christ honestly, faithfully, sincerely and truthfully, holding him up, not ourselves, exalting Christ and not our theories, presenting Christ and not our opinions, advocating Christ and not some false doctrine, then the Holy Ghost will come and bear witness. He will testify that what we say is true. When he comes, he will confirm the word with signs following. This is one of the strongest proofs that our gospel is divine that it is of divine origin, that not only did Christ teach these things, but when leaving the world he said, Ye shall glorify me, and he will testify of me. If you will just look at the second chapter of Acts, so that the wonderful sermon that Peter preached, the 36th verse, you will read these words, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when Peter said this, the Holy Ghost descended upon the people and testified of Christ, bore witness and signal demonstration that all this was true. And again, in the 40th verse, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untowards generation. In many other words did he testify, not only these words that have been recorded, but many other words. The Sure Guide. Turn to the 16th chapter of John, in the 13th verse, and read, how that when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, they shall, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He will guide you into all truth. Now there is not a truth that we ought to know, but the Spirit of God will guide us into it, if we will let him. If we will yield ourselves up to be directed by the Spirit, and let him lead us, he will guide us into all truth. It would have saved us from a great many dark hours if we had only been willing to let the Spirit of God be our counselor and guide. Lot never would have gone to Sodom if he had been guided by the Spirit of God. David never would have fallen into sin and had all that trouble with his family if he had been guided by the Spirit of God. There are many Lots and Davids nowadays. The churches are full of them. Men and women are in total darkness because they have not been willing to be guided by the Spirit of God. He shall guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself. He shall speak of the ascended, glorified Christ. What would be taught of a messenger entrusted by an absent husband with a message for his wife or mother who, on arrival, only talked of himself and his conceits and ignored both the husband and the message? You would simply call it outrageous. What then must be the crime of the professed teacher who speaks of himself for some insipid theory, leaving out Christ in his gospel? If we witness according to the Spirit, we must witness of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is down here in this dark world to just speak of the absent one, and he takes the things of Christ and brings them to our mind. He testifies of Christ. He guides us into the truth about him. Wrappings in the Dark I want to say right here that I think in this day a great many children of God are turning aside and committing a grievous sin. I don't know as they think it is a sin, but if we examine the scriptures, I am sure we will find that it is a great sin. We are told that the Comforter is sent into the world to guide us into all truth. And if he is sent for that purpose, do we need any other guide? Need we hide in the darkness, consulting with mediums who profess to call up the spirits of the dead? 
Do you know what the Word of God pronounces against that fearful sin? I believe it is one of the greatest sins we have to contend with at the present day. It is dishonoring to the Holy Spirit for me to go and sum up the dead and confer with them, even if it were possible. I would like you to notice the 10th chapter of the First Chronicles in the 13th verse. So Saul died for his transgressions, which he had committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom into David the son of Jesse. God slew him for this very sin. Of the two sins that were brought against Saul here, one is that he would not listen to the word of God, and the second is that he consulted a familiar spirit. He was snared by this great evil and sinned against God. Saul fell right here and there are a great many of God's professed children today who think there is no harm in consulting a medium who pretends to call up some of the departed to inquire of them. But how dishonoring it is to God who has sent the Holy Spirit into this world to guide us into all truth. There is not a thing that I need to know. There is not a thing that is important for me to know. There is not a thing that I ought to know. But the Spirit of God will reveal it to me through the Word of God. And if I turn my back upon the Holy Spirit, I am dishonoring the Spirit of God, and I am committing a grievous sin. You know, we read in Luke, there was that rich man in the other world wanted to have someone sent to his father's house to warn his five brothers. Christ said, They have Moses and the prophets. And if they will not hear them, they will not hear one, though he rose from the dead. Moses and the prophets, the part of the Bible then com completed, that is enough. But a great many people now want something besides the word of God and are turning aside to these false lights. Spirits that peep and mutter. There was another passage which reads, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? What is that but table wrapping and cabinet hiding? If it was a message from God, do you think you would have to go into a dark room and put out all the lights? In secret, my master taught nothing. God is not in that movement, and we want, as children of God, is to keep ourselves from this evil. And then, notice the, fo the verse following quoted so often out of its connection, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Any man and any woman who comes to us with any doctrine that is not according to the law and the testimony, let us understand that they are from the evil one and that they are enemies of righteousness. They have no light in them. Now you will find these people who are consulting familiar spirits first and last attack the word of God. They don't believe it. Still a great many people say, you must hear both sides. But if a man should write me a most slanderous letter about his wife, I don't think I would have to read it. I should tear it up and throw it to the winds. Have I to read all the infidel books that are written to hear both sides? Have I to take a book that is a slander on my Lord and Master, who has redeemed me with his blood? Ten thousand times, no, I will not touch it. Now the Spirit speaketh expressively, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. That is pretty plain language, isn't it? Doctrines of devils. Again, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences sheared with a hot iron. There are other passages of scriptures warning against every delusion of Satan. Let us ever remember the Spirit has been sent into the world to guide us into all truth. We don't want any other guide. He is enough. Some people say, is not conscience a safer guide than the Word and the Spirit? No, it is not. Some people don't seem to have any conscience and don't know what it means. Their education has a good deal to do with conscience. There are persons who will say that their conscience did not tell them that they had done wrong until after the wrong was done. But what we want is something to tell us a thing is wrong before we do it. Very often a man will go and commit some awful crime, and after it is done his conscience will wake up and lash and scourge him, and then it is too late, the act is done. The Unerring Guide I am told by people who have been over the Alps that the guide fastens them 
if they are going in a dangerous place, right to himself, and he just goes on before. They are fastened to the guide. So shall the Christian be linked to his unerring guide and be safely upheld. Why, if a man was going through the mammoth cave, it would be death to him if he strayed away from his guide. If separated from him, he would certainly perish. There are pitfalls in that cave and a bottomless river, and there would be no chance for a man to find his way through that cave without a guide or a light. So there is no chance for us to get through the dark wilderness of this world alone. It is folly for a man or woman to think that they can get through this evil world without the light of God's word and the guidance of the divine spirit. God sent him to guide us through this great journey, and if we seek to work independent of him, we shall stumble in the deep darkness of eternity's night. But bear in mind the words of the Spirit of God. If you want to be guided, you must study the Word, because the Word is the light of the Spirit. In the 14th chapter of John, and 26th verse, we read, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Again, in John chapter 16, verse 13, I'll bet when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. A great many people seem to think that the Bible is out of date, that it is an old book, and they think it has passed its day. They say it was very good for the dark ages, and that there is some very good history in it, but then it was not intended for the present time that we are living in a very enlightened age, and that man can get on very well without the old book, that we have outgrown it. They think we have no use for it because it is an old book. Now you might just as well say that the sun, which has shone so long, is now so old that it is out of date, and that whenever a man builds a house, he need not put any windows in it, because we have got a newer light and a better light. We have gas light and this new electric light. These are something new, and I would advise people, if they think the Bible is too old and worn out, that they build houses not to put any windows in them, but just to light them with this new electric light. That is something new, and this is what they are anxious for. People talk about this book as if they understood it, but we don't know much about it yet. The press gives us the daily news of what has taken place. This Bible, however, tells us what is about to take place. This is new. We have the news here in this book. This tells us of the things that will surely come to pass, and that is a great deal newer than anything in the newspapers. It tells us that the Spirit shall teach us all things, not only guide us into all truth, but teach us all things. He teaches us how to pray. And I don't think there has ever been a prayer upon this sin-cursed earth that has been indicated by the Holy Spirit, but was answered. There is much praying that is not in, in indicated by the Holy Spirit. In former years, I was very ambitious to get rich. I used to pray for $100,000, and was my aim. I used to say, God does not answer my prayer, he does not make me rich. But I had no warrant for such a prayer. Yet a good many people pray in that way. They think that they pray, but they do not pray according to the scriptures. The Spirit of God has nothing to do with their prayers, and such prayers are not the product of his teaching. It is the Spirit who teaches us how to answer our enemies. If a man strikes me, I should not pull out a revolver and shoot him. The Spirit of the Lord doesn't teach me revenge. He doesn't teach me that it is necessary to draw the sword and cut a man down in order to defend my rights. Some people say, you are a coward if you don't strike back. Christ says, turn the other cheek to him who smites. I would rather take Christ's teaching than any other. I don't think a man gains much by loading himself down with weapons to defend himself. There has been life enough sacrificed in this country to teach men a lesson in this regard. The word of God is a much better protection than the revolver. We had better take the word of God to protect us by accepting its teaching and living out its precepts. An aid to memory. 
It is a great comfort to us to remember that another office of the Spirit is to bring the teaching of Jesus to our remembrance. This was our Lord's promise. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. John chapter 14 verse 26. How striking that is. I think there are many Christians who have had that experience. They have been testifying and found that while talking for Christ, the Spirit has just brought into mind some of the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ, and their mind was soon filled with the Word of God. When we have the Spirit resting upon us, we can speak with authority and power, and the Lord will bless our testimony and bless our work. I believe the reason why God makes use of so few in the church is because there is not in them the power that God can use. He is not going to use our ideas, but we must have the Word of God hidden in our hearts, and then, the Holy Spirit inflaming us, we will have the testimony, which will be rich and sweet and fresh, and the Lord's Word will vindicate itself in blessed results. God wants to use us. God wants to make us channels of blessing. But we are in such a condition, He does not use us. That is the trouble. There are so many men who have no testimony for the Lord. If they speak... They speak without saying anything. And if they pray, their prayer is powerless. They do not plead in prayer. Their prayer is just a few set phrases that you have heard too often. Now, what we want is to be so full of the word that the Spirit coming upon us shall bring to mind, bring to our remembrance, the words of our Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We hear that quoted so often in prayer. Many a man weaves it into his prayer and stops right there. And the moment you talk about heaven, they say, Oh, we don't know anything about heaven. It hath not entered into the heart of man. I hath not seen, and it is all speculation. We have nothing to do with it. And they say they quote it as it is written. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man that which God hath prepared for them that love him. What next? But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. You see, the Lord hath revealed them unto us. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. That is just what the Spirit does. Long and short sight. He brings to our mind what God has in store for us. I heard a man some time ago speaking about Abraham. He said, Abraham was not tempted by the well-watered plains of Sodom. For Abraham was what you might call a long-sighted man. He had his eyes set on the city which had foundation, whose builder and maker is God. But Lot was a short-sighted man. And there are many people in the church who are very short-sighted. They only see see things right around them. They think good. Abraham was long-sighted. He had glimpses of the celestial city. Moses was long-sighted, and he left the palaces of Egypt and identified himself with God's people, poor people, who were slaves. But he had something in view yonder. He could see something God had in store. Again, there are some people who are sort of long-sighted and short-sighted too. I have a friend who has one eye that is long-sighted, and the other eye is short-sighted. And I think the church is full of this kind of people. They want one eye for the world and the other for the kingdom of God. Therefore, everything is blurred. One eye is long and the other is short. All is confusion. And they see men as trees walking. The church is filled with that sort of people. But Stephen was long-sighted. He looked clear into heaven. They couldn't convince him, even when he was dying, that Christ had not ascended to heaven. Look, look yonder, he says. I see him over there. He is on the throne, standing at the right hand of God. And he looked clear into heaven. The world had no temptation for him. He had put the world under his feet. Paul was another of those long-sighted men. He had been caught up and see things unlawful for him to utter, things grand and glorious. I tell you, when the Spirit of God is on us, the world looks very empty. The world has a very small hold upon us, and we begin to let go our hold of it. When the Spirit of God is on us, we will just let go the things of time and lay hold of things eternal. This is the church's need today. We want the Spirit to come in mighty power and consume all the vile dross there is in us. 
Oh, that the spirit of fire may come down and burn everything in us that is contrary to God's blessed word and will. In John chapter 14, verse 16, we read of the Comforter. This is the first time he is spoken of as the Comforter. Christ has had been their Comforter. God had set him to comfort their sorrowing. It was prophesied of him, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. You can't heal the brokenhearted without the Comforter. But the world would not have the first Comforter. And so they rose up and took him to Calvary and put him to death. But on going away, he said, I will send you another Comforter. You shall not be comfortless. Be of good cheer, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All these three passages are brought to the remembrance of God's people. And they help us to rise out of the fog in the midst of the world. Oh, what a comforter is the Holy Spirit of God. The faithful friend. The Holy Spirit tells a man of his faults in order to lead him to a better life. In John chapter 16, verse 8, we read, He is to reprove the world of sin. Now, there are a class of people who don't like this part of the Spirit's work. Do you know why? Because he convicts them of sin. They don't like that. What they want is someone to speak comforting words and make everything pleasant. Keep everything all quiet. Tell them there is peace when there is war. Tell them it is light when it is dark. Tell them everything is growing better. But the world is getting on amazingly in goodness. That it is growing better all the time. That is the kind of preaching they seek for. Men think they are a great deal better than their fathers were. That suits human nature, for it is full of pride. Men will strut around and say, Yes, I believe that. The world is improving. I am a good deal better man than father was. My father was too strict. He was one of those old uh, puritanical men who was so rigid. Oh, we are getting on. We are more liberal. My father wouldn't think of going out riding on Sunday, but we will. We will trample the laws of God under our feet. We are better than our fathers. That is the kind of preaching which some dearly love, and there are preachers who tickle such itching ears. When we bring the word of God to bear upon them, and when the Spirit drives it home, then men will say, I don't like that kind of preaching. I will never go to hear that man again. And sometimes they will get up and stamp their way out of church before the speaker gets through. They don't like it. But when the Spirit of God is at work, he convinces men of sin. When he comes, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin. Not because men swear and lie and steal and get drunk and murder, of sin, because they believe not on me. The Climax Sin This is the sin of the world. Why, a great many people think that unbelief is a sort of misfortune. But do not know, if you will uh, allow me the expression, it is the damning sin of the world today. That is what unbelief is, the mother of all sin. There would not be a drunkard walking the streets if it were not for unbelief. There would not be a hollered walking the streets if it were not for unbelief. There would not be a murderer if it was not for unbelief. It is the germ of all sin. Don't think for a moment that it is a misfortune. But just bear in mind, it is an awful sin. And may the Holy Spirit convict every reader that unbelief is making God a liar. Many a man has been knocked down on the streets because someone has told him he was a liar. Unbelief is giving God the lie. That is the plain English of it. Some people seem to boast of their unbelief. They seem to think it is quite respectable to be an infidel and doubt God's word, and they will vainly boast and say, I have intellectual difficulties. I can't believe. Oh, that the Spirit of God may come and convict men of sin. That is what we need. His convicting power. And I am so thankful that God has not put that into our hands. We have not to convict men. If we had, I would get discouraged and give up preaching and go back to business within the next 48 hours. It is my work to preach and hold up the cross and testify of Christ, but it is his work to convict men of sin and lead them to Christ. One thing I have noticed is that some conversations don't amount to anything, that if a man professes to be converted without conviction of sin, he is one of those stony ground hearers who don't bring forth much fruit. 
the first little wave of persecution, the first breath of opposition, and that man is back in the world again. Let us pray, dear Christian reader, that God may carry on a deep and thorough work, that men may be convicted of sin so that they cannot rest in unbelief. Let us pray, God, it may be a thorough work in the land. I would a great deal rather see a hundred men thoroughly converted, truly born of God, than to see a thousand professed conversions where the Spirit of God has not convicted of sin. Don't let us cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Don't go to the man who is living in sin and tell him all he has to do is to stand right up and profess without any hatred for sin. Let us ask God first to show every man the plague of his own heart, that the Spirit may convict them of sin. Then will the work in our hands be real and deep and abide the fury trial that will try every man's labors. Thus far we have found the work of the Spirit is to impart life to implant hope, to give liberty, to testify of Christ, to guide us into all truth, to teach us all things, to comfort the believer, and to convict the world of sin. End of chapter 3. Having been read by Peter John Parisi, he's also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.